Well, good morning, everyone. I would love to tell you about an experience I had a while ago at, at, at a three-year-old birthday party. Those are the circles that I roll in uh, these days with my kids. But um, I saw that my buddy got an invite to this three, three-year-old party, and uh, something that I really love is the cake. So I'm tucking into the cake, and, uh, and my buddy starts striking up a conversation with someone who I know from other circles. Now, this guy uh, is the CEO of one of the biggest logistical firms uh, globally. And, um, and, and my buddy, I mean, he's no like, uh, he hasn't, not a mover and shaker, he hasn't any gr- done great things, you know, he's just an ordinary guy, those are the kind of people I roll with. But anyway, this conversation uh, starts happening and, and I start leaning in and it was quite an interesting conversation because it felt a little one-sided to me. You know, my buddy was like, talking about business and about this and about that and using all this language. Uh, And then it kind of moved into bragging, you know, and and he starts bragging and I'm I'm just watching the CEO and he speaks about what he's done and this and this and this. Uh, And then, I I mean, I noticed my buddy started dropping in like lines of advice. You know, hey, you, you should try this kind of fleet or you should try this kind of business practice or you should try and... At this point, I'm just wanting the earth to swallow me up. You know, the CEO, he held it together. I could see in his heart, I mean, his eyes weren't rolling or anything. But I really had this thought. I'm like, dude, do you realize who you're speaking to? I mean, do you honestly realize who it is you are speaking to at the moment? I know it's a three-year-old party, but oh my gosh. Now, I don't know if this has happened to some of you before, you know, it's like you, you go off at that, that coach, and it's like, this coach doesn't know what he's doing. He didn't put my son on the field, and da, da And then you walk away, and you realize that was the coach's wife you were bleating to. And it's like, oh, did I really do that? Or you go off and like, this headmaster doesn't know what he's doing, and making all these decisions, and, and, and what a, what a, what a, what a. And then you, you leave that conversation, you realize someone's like, that was the headmaster's assistant. You know, good luck at your son getting through matric. But, but we've all had these kinds of experiences, and it makes us sick in the stomach, and it's like, yeah, I need a hole. Somewhere, just swallow me up. That's my life. It's over. But this is no different when it comes to our relationship with God. You know, for many of us, maybe uh, today, we kind of got dressed, and we get the kids ready, and we get the nappy bag ready, and we kind of rush here, and we've had breakfast, and we speed into church, and we try and find a parking, and we hoot, hey, get out of the way, and you get into this parking, uh, and then you drop the kids off, and then you start singing the song, and everyone else is singing. You don't really realize what you're singing, and then the preacher starts preaching, and it's like, you start planning, you know, like, uh, I wonder what we're going to have for lunch. Or I wonder who I need to meet with this week. And the question that I want to ask this morning is how does heaven's CEO, how does God himself make you realize who it is you're really speaking to? Who it is you're really coming before? You know, who it is you're really living in front of? How does God do that? Well, we're in a series at the moment that we've, we've kind of kicked off last week. We were looking at the life of Samuel. And like you and like my friend, Israel was no different to this scenario. You see, Israel lived as if they had no king or or they lived without any regard to God. And so everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And that's what we looked at uh, last week. And this nation hit rock bottom because of it. Now today, we're gonna look at a woman by the name of Hannah, Now, Hannah is Samuel's mom. And what's so interesting about this story is that Hannah struggled to have children. She just couldn't have children. And God deals with Hannah in such a way that she starts to realize who it is she is living before, who it is she is speaking to, who it is that she's worshiping. And we'll see in the life of Hannah that that Hannah's almost like this this mirror, you know, that that Hannah's situation, it reflects the people of God's situation, and particularly Israel in that time, a rock bottom situation, and that Hannah's turning point is actually God's desire for a turning point in his people, and that Hannah's renewed conviction after God deals with this woman is God's longing 
for his people to have a similar conviction about him. So can you journey with me into this account as we kick off this amazing book and look at Hannah's situation? And as I said, Hannah struggled to have children. Now there was a certain man from Ramatham, a Zuphnite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. Now Elkanah, he was the son of, who was the son of, who was the son of, who was the son of. Now, why this is interesting is that we'll learn that this baby boy, Samuel, comes from the Levitical uh, kind of priesthood or, or, or tribe. But more than that, the author is saying it's so important for Elkanah's generation to carry on. You know, my dad and his dad and his dad and his dad, and it's like, it's so important that, that this line carries on, that the family tree doesn't cease. But, but notice the situation because Elkanah had two wives, the one he called Hannah, and the other one he called Peninnah. So for today, can we just call her Penny? Okay, now, now Penny had children, but Hannah had none. Now Hannah, H- Hannah would, have, would have been Elkanah's first uh, wife, and because she was struggling to have children, I think Elkanah's like, one of the most important things for me to do is to carry on my name. The son of, the son of, the son of thing has to happen, and it happens through a son. And she's not really living up to scratch, so he, he kind of hooks up with Penny and makes her his wife. Now, Hannah would have felt like an outcast. In that time, this was like the function of a wife, you, you know, to, to bear children and to continue the line. Everyone would have like <clears throat> smuggled as, as she kind of walked past. She would have known that she is barren. And because of this, her life was pointless. I mean, what was the point of her existence? Now, year after year, this man, Alkani, he went up uh, from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. Now, this is huge. In the Old Testament scriptures, this is the first time, the first time ever that God gives us a new name by which he wants to be known by. Everyone reading would have known Yahweh, 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 but here it is Yahweh Almighty. It's a brand new name. You see, this Lord Almighty means the God of angel armies. Not not just the captain of a team, you know, not just the headmaster of a school, not just the CEO of a business, not just the president of a country, but the God of not only armies, but angel armies, the king of legions and legions and legions of armies at his beck and call. And he's starting here at this point in history to say, I would like Hannah and I would like God's people to refer to me this way. And I mean, you know, when people ask me, why'd you name your son that? Why'd you name your daughter that? Because it's by that name that, that we know that person. And it is a big deal in ancient literature that this happens. So for the first time in history, God drops in and he's like, I wanna be known as the Lord Almighty. Now, Elkanah is very unlike Israel because Israel lived as if there was no Lord Almighty, as if there was no king, and everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. But this family heads towards Shiloh. It takes a 22-kilometer journey, starting to realize who it is that they are coming to and who it is that they are coming before. Now, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he'd give portions of meat to his wife, Penny, and all her sons and daughters. You know, Penny had so many sons and daughters, and it's like, after the sacrifice, Elkanah would be like, yeah, Penny, here's your plate of food, and all the boys and girls, here's your plate of food. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. I mean, here's just an extra little piece of steak. And there are two reasons for this because he loved her. Uh, Maybe he loved her more than Penny. And because the Lord had closed her womb. Now, Now, Penny would have been one of those women that if she could have, she would have gone for IVF treatment. She would have gone and seen the homeopath. You know, she would have watched her diet. She would have made sure that Elkanah was kind of in line with her cycle as to when she could fall pregnant and, and kind of push Penny to the side. Like, her deepest desire was to have a child. 
But she knew as she headed towards Shiloh, it was this Lord Almighty, this new name by which God wanted to know, be known by, that had closed her womb, which was a bitter pill potentially for her to stomach. Now, because the Lord had closed her womb, Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Penny would have those comments. You know, Penny would say those things. Kemi would, uh, Penny would, 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 would make her know kind of the situation. I mean, let's just imagine, you've got all the kids around the table, you've gone to this annual feast, and it's like, oh, uh, boys and girls, do you all have your food? You know, wow, there's just so many of you. And one of the, one of the children says, mommy, mommy, why does Hannah have no children? And Penny would have been, what, sorry, just, I didn't hear that. Can you say that again? Um, and, and then, no, 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 mommy, doesn't Hannah want children? <clears throat> oh, well, I, I, think, I, think she, I think so. I think she does want, want children. Does, does daddy want Hannah to have children? Yeah, daddy really wants her to have children, but she's been a little bit disappointing in that area. You know, mommy, does, does God not like Hannah? Does God want Hannah to have children? And Penny would have been... Yeah, we don't know. We don't know if it's God's fault or if it's because Hannah has this pile of sin. And as she hands out the food, she would have said, oh, oh, by the way, Hannah, I'm pregnant again. And this would have gone on year after year. This didn't go on day after day. This didn't go on week after week. This, this didn't go on month after month. I'm saying this went on year after year after year. This was Hannah's ache. And every time she headed toward the temple, this kind of thing would happen. It says, whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her, provoked her so badly till she wept. And then she cried. I almost think she struggled with depression that she just would not eat. This poor woman. Now, Elkanah, like maybe some of us husbands, tries to really bring hope in the situation. And so her husband, Elkanah, would say, Hannah, why are you weeping? You know, why don't you eat something? Food can make you better. Why are you downhearted? Why? Why are you so sad? You know, don't, don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? And here we see Hannah's situation. She is desperate for a baby. And she's kind of in this, this household where there's domestic conflict. And it's like she's in this impossible situation. You know, you can imagine Hannah. Everybody else is fine. As she goes to the shopping mall, she notices all the little babies and the kids. And, and she would have asked questions like, is God punishing me? You know, has, has God left me? And, and, and Hannah, she, she was faithful. I mean, she is the first woman in the Old Testament to have gone to the house of the Lord. This, this was not done. And your penny tagged along, but she showed great faith here. She was faithful. And yet year after year after year, she had to live in this ache, knowing that romance wouldn't fix it, knowing that food wouldn't fix it. And she knew something about this new name that the Lord Almighty that he had done this. And because of this, it is so incredible to me how Hannah responds. It's like she responds very differently in this next scene than she has year after year after year. And this for me, I think, is Hannah's turning point. So can we just look together at, at what happens in the life of Hannah and, and her turning point? You see, once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up and it's like, it's like she snapped. It's like she popped. It's like this boil was, was lanced. Enough is enough. And, and when she had this moment, um, Eli the priest was sitting at the chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord. And she wept bitterly. She's like, it's me, oh God. It's me, oh God, standing in the need of prayer. And she makes this vow. Enough is enough. She makes a promise, a covenantal promise to her God. And she refers to him, maybe for the first time, I don't know, but she refers to him in the way 
that God wants to be known and the way that God wants to be dealt with on these terms. And she says, Yahweh, Lord, but not just Lord, Lord Almighty, God of angel armies. If, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, if you will do that, Lord, well then, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. You see, th this isn't a quick fix kind of prayer. This isn't God make me rich and then I'll give you some money. This isn't bail me out, Lord, and I'll do something for you. This is the language of covenant. This is the language of, of marriage relationship, of promise. And it's almost like what Hannah's saying is, God, if you will give me a son, then Lord, I'll give, I'll give him back to you. It's like, give me a son, but only Lord, if he will be used for your kingdom purposes. If, if it will advance your purposes in history, then do that, Lord. And she would have known as a woman, she would have known the risk of this promise because she would have been familiar with numbers that if someone makes a promise before the Lord, especially a woman, and the husband comes in and says, lady, you are crazy. You are off your rocker. Like then that promise would be null and void. And she would have to live with that on her conscience for all the days of her life. But this is so different to the way that God's people were responding, making promises and then breaking them. You know, the, the, she responds so differently. She could have just bottled it up for the rest of her life and pushed it down and, and toughened up and, 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 and this is how you're gonna, you're gonna deal with it, Hannah, and, and become this bitter old hag. Or, or she could have burst out at the dinner table and, and, and taken cheap shots at Penny across the table and wiped out the kids with her language and tell the Alkana she wants nothing to do with him and just burst out in anger. Or she could have backslid. You know, in her life, she's like, you know what? I want nothing to do with this Lord Almighty. She throws in the towel. And in fact, this was Israel's common practice. Eli would have known that, that Israel would have turned to pills or, or the bottle or to medication. Look at this, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Now Eli is like the senior pastor of that day at Shiloh. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought, you know, that she was drunk and, she, and said to her, how long are you gonna stay drunk? Put away your wine. Because that's, that's how Israel, that's how God's people deal with their kind of situations in that kind of day. But Hannah's starting to real, realize something different. She's starting to come to the God who has a new name in history. So she says, not so, my Lord. Hannah replied, I'm a woman who is deeply troubled and I've not been drinking wine or beer. No, 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 I'm different to Israel. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. You know, I wasn't pouring wine. I was, I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. It's like this boil needed to be lanced. This, this ache of mine, year after year, this building up and festering, it needed, to be take some, some, it needed to be taken somewhere. And so I poured out my soul to the Lord, but not just the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the God of angel armies. Don't, don't take your servant for a wicked woman, a useless, barren, outcast, good for nothing, can't do the and his son and his son and his son kind of lineage thing. Don't regard me like that. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. So Eli's like, whoa, this is, this is out of the ordinary. This doesn't happen at the house of the Lord. You know, and he responds to her. Eli says, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked of him. And she said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. And then it is just amazing. She went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. I mean, her prayer hasn't even been answered. It's not like her prayer's been answered and she leaves the, the temple of God at Shiloh differently. She's just a different woman. You know, what, what on earth was the change? What what led her, her husband would have looked at her and said, gee, she's eating. There's, there's something different here. She's no longer downcast. What has brought this about? And I think the point is, 
that Hannah knew where to go. She maybe had tried doctors, she had spoken to friends, she had tried a bit of food on the odd occasion or romance, but she knew that the God who was introducing himself with a new name, well, he was the right place to go, the Lord Almighty, because it was the Lord Almighty that closed her womb. And it may be the Lord Almighty that opens her womb, but that is not the concern for her. This was the one that she could pour out her soul to. And I think this is a turning point in the life of Hannah. And what is so interesting from here is that God does immeasurably more. You see, early, early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back home to Ramah. That 22 kilometer journey, but she goes back so different. And in the course of time, Elkanah, well, he made love to his wife, Hannah. I know the gents at this point are like, Ryan, can we just meditate on this verse? Like, what, what, what does this mean? You know, can we unpack that? Bible study leaders get ready. Like, what does that mean? Parents, the teenagers, like, you, you know, there's a piece of scripture I didn't understand. You know, can you, can you just meditate? But this is why I say, guys, just read your Bibles. I mean, it's awesome. But anyway, it's in that private setting that this all-knowing God is involved. And the Lord remembered her in these intimate moments. And so in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Now this is the Samuel that plays this facilitation role where Israel is transitioned from judges across the land to a monarchy, you know, where kings are put in place. This is that Samuel. This is the Samuel that hears directly from God. This is the Samuel that speaks to kings, tribes, uh, nations, to people, to individuals. This is the Samuel that reverse, that God uses to reverse Israel's impossible situation, to reverse their rock bottom situation where the Canaanites were provoking and irritating and the Philistines. This is the Samuel that God uses, that she gives birth to. And Hannah did not even know that the Lord was that almighty yet. We're not there in the story. Hannah couldn't imagine how almighty is the almighty, the God of angel armies. Now at this point, you're probably wondering like I am, you know, Hannah made a promise in that prayer, a significant covenant promise. Did Hannah give up her baby boy, her treasure? Well, I think here she hits a bit of a wobble. And again, Hannah's a mirror of Israel who would make promises and bail out. So when her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow as he would usually. Notice what the text says. Hannah did not go. Is she gonna come good on her promise? And she starts saying to her husband, and this makes me nervous, she's like, you know, after the boy's weaned, I'll take him and present him before the Lord and then he'll live there always. And the husband responds to her, in the same way the book of Judges ends in the verse that we looked at last week. He says, honey, do what is right in your own eyes. I mean, maybe she's not realizing who it is that answered her prayer. But then her husband says something significant. Her husband, Elkanah, told her, stay here until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord make good your word. And I think the NIV translation's got it wrong. It says his word. It's only may the Lord make good your word. May the Lord Almighty, may he enable you to keep your promise, O Israel, O Hannah. And so the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. And then look how amazing this is. I mean, this is a significantly difficult thing that she's gonna do at this point. This is her treasure. This is her baby boy. And after she had weaned him, she took the boy with her, young as he was, this tiny baby, and she takes this 22 kilometer journey up toward the temple of God in Shiloh. You know, she maybe would have thought in her head, you know, the cry room at Shiloh is not that great. You, you know, she would have thought, this boy is so young and he's gonna get flu if he comes in contact with all these other uh, sinners, I mean, or parents or whatever. But she takes her baby, she puts him in the carry cot, in the pram, you know, packs the nappies, and she heads toward the spiritual boarding house where she knows she's gonna do a great thing and give up her son. 
And not only does she give everything, but she gives even more. Along with her, she takes this three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And this is significant. I mean, a three-year-old bull would have been a very expensive gift. You know, it would have been over and above the requirement. Flour, well, she was only required to take three-tenths of flour, but she takes a whole bag of flour and this wine skin. And so you can imagine her lugging her way on this journey, and she comes, and she brought him and all this stuff to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Now, when the bull had been sacrificed, they brought this boy to Eli. So you can imagine, you've got Elkanah, this boy, this bull's gone, flower, wine, and now she comes to Eli. And she says, Eli, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I, there's something that I've come to know about God that is very different. I am that woman. God's done a personal work in how I see him. And I'm the woman here that stood before you. And she said, and I prayed for this child and the Lord granted me what I asked of him. You know, this little baby boy that that I'm showing you now, Eli. And so now I give him to the Lord. Can you imagine that moment? It's like, Eli, this baby boy belongs to the Lord. Look after him. And then she says, for his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Now let's look at at Hannah's turning point. She makes this covenant vow. She pours out her heart and God does immeasurably more than she can imagine. And she almost had second thoughts. I mean, you can imagine the the baby's so young, you know, and and they would have, she would have had nicknames like, ooh, Sammy and my little Sam Sam and all, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And, and, And this little baby would have been close to her breast, you know, as, as he would suck that milk and you know those late nights when she would hear Sammy uh, like gurgle and then wah, like for milk and she would go to him and, and they would have these intimate nights together. And she would have seen old Sammy's first steps and take a WhatsApp and send it to her family in Jerusalem or whatever. And this, this would have been at least a year. And maybe she was tempted to have thoughts. Uh, God didn't actually do this thing. You know, I, maybe we just, Elkanah and I made love you know, at the right time. But because she realized this name, this new name, that this, that this is the Lord Almighty who closed my womb, and because she realized that, that this is the Lord Almighty that I can pour my heart out to, he was worthy to give it all, to, to give it all up. And so she keeps her promise because I think she has a, a realizing moment of who it is she is living before. And we're gonna see in these next moments, Hannah's renewed conviction. It it, it comes out of like this this moment of prayer. And her prayer, it kind of reflects that, that God orchestrated this event in her life to change how she views God. And so let's notice how, how different her prayer is this time than it was when she was at Shiloh a year or two ago. And so the text says, then Hannah prayed and she says this, my heart rejoices in, my heart rejoices in Samuel. No, no, my heart rejoices in Elkanah. No, my, my heart rejoices in the medical doctors. No, no, she says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Because it is this God, the Lord Almighty, that my horn is lifted up and my mouth boasts over my enemies. And here she's referring to Penny. This is her personal experience. For I delight in your deliverance, God. You did something that no one could do. And you did it so that I could come to realize that you are the Lord Almighty. In fact, God, there is no one holy like the Lord. This is her conviction. There's no one besides you. There's no rock like our God. She's like, don't, don't keep on talking so proudly or let your mouth you know, speak such arrogance for the Lord is the God who knows and by him all the deeds of my life were weighed. He knew my situation. He knew that I was faithfully heading to Shiloh where no one else was. This is the all-knowing God. And then in her prayer now at this next point, she reveals that God actually to her mind uses events to introduce people like her and many other people to this God, to this God who wants to be known and recognized by a new name in Israel's point in history. 
She says God does these kinds of things that, that make them recognize who he is. You know, the bows of warriors are, are broken sometimes, but those who stumble are armed with strength. You know, that, that those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are hungry are hungry no more. And when you see things like this happen, you should say, that, that's the Lord Almighty. Or in her case, she who is barren has borne seven children, but she who has many sons pines away. That penny is a footnote in history. But that this woman, who had come to recognize and realize who it is she was speaking to, who it is she was dealing with, the Lord Almighty had changed her circumstance. You see, God uses other things. The Lord brings death, and sometimes he makes alive. He brings down to the grave, and he, and he raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth, and he humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap, and he seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. And this is supposed to make us think of even David, who was this poor shepherd boy, who God raises up, and it's like, He's the Lord Almighty. He does these kinds of things. Do I realize, do I recognize, Hannah has a new conviction. And her reason is because the foundations of the earth are the Lord's and on them he set the world. Because God has created everything, part of his creation has been my womb. And because of that, he is the Lord Almighty, the one, the God of angel armies who can close my womb and who can open my womb, but he will orchestrate the events of life for me to come to realize personally who it is I come to and who it is that I'm speaking to. He'll guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be break, broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And this is Hannah's prayer with brand new conviction. And so then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. And they go home so different. I mean, notice the difference between the two prayers. Her first her first prayer is, it's filled with, with vows and covenant language and pain and pleading and pouring out. But her second is so different. It's filled with truths, but truths from, from personal experience. And, and, and her prayers have like this, you know, he gives and he takes. He brings death and he brings life. He's kind of this, this all-knowing God and he provides in unique ways. And, and everything was around you know, this whole episode was built around two words for Hannah to come to realize that he is the Lord Almighty. That is what God was doing in Hannah's life. I mean, think about it. Hannah, she, she takes a seat back, maybe after the event, and she's like, I realized that it was the Lord Almighty, the God of angel armies, who closed my womb. It, it, was the, it was this Lord Almighty who put penny in my life. And it was this year after year ache that God used for me to come in and well just pop and pour out my heart before the Lord. And in, in fact, it was the event of Samuel's birth that was a tailor-made event that actually made me realize that God wants me to know him personally by a different name, to deal with him on different terms. And, and we see in her prayer this like renewed conviction that, that God uses many other things in life for, for her and for Israel and for God's people to recognize that he is the Lord Almighty, the God of angel armies. And that as history unfolds, can you imagine as she looked at this baby boy and what God did? You know, that, that actually the whole book of Samuel is written for anyone who would read it to realize uh, Saul is not the king of kings. David is not the king of kings. Solomon's not the king of kings. God, God the Lord Almighty, he is the king, not only of kings, but of angel armies. And she came to this personal conviction as God dealt with her so mercifully and graciously. And the question that I wanna ask you this morning and the question that I've been asking myself is what would God have to do in your life for you to realize He is the Lord Almighty? 
What would God have to do in my life for me to realize that, Ryan, I want you to personally know that I am the God, not only the, the, the Yahweh God, the I am who I am God, but the God of angel armies. Maybe that speaks into your scenario. If I had to ask you Elkanah's question, why, why are you so sad? Do you potentially have Hannah's ache for this purpose? Has God put a penny in your life for this very reason? Could, could it be that unsaved husband and it just breaks your heart year after year? Could it be that, that awful marriage, like God, when, when are you gonna change this man? You just don't understand the domestic conflict that I'm in. It is so difficult to wake up in this home. Could it be that department that you're in with that provoking penny and it's like you feel like this outcast, you're this Christ follower and it's like you haven't come to realize who the Lord Almighty is and he's placed you in impossible situations and sometimes he uses life and sometimes he uses death and sometimes you walk, walk around feeling like your life is barren, that it's fruitless, that it's meaningless but these things are maybe governed by the sovereign God for you to come and say, Lord, it's me, O oh Lord, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And you pour out your heart to the one who can do something about it. And that may be enough for you to realize he's the Lord Almighty, the God of angel armies. Maybe you sit here today and you're not a Christian. Could God be using a crisis in your life? You, you know, the, he gives life, and he brings death. He exalts and he humbles. He uses these situations to bring you to a personal conviction, which is the most important conviction before you stand before him one day. I want you to know my child. I want you to know my son. I want you to know my daughter that I am your Lord, God Almighty, the King of angel armies. Could he have a Hannah in your life where she sings these songs in the office around you all day long, around he is the Lord Almighty, he did this in my situation, listen to my personal testimony. And you look at that person's life as a non-Christian and you say, you know, I don't like these weirdos, but there's something different here. You, you know, there's something intriguing here. Could he have be using historical events? I mean, doesn't it ring true? To us, a son is born, but not just a Samuel, the ultimate Samuel, Jesus I mean, doesn't, isn't that striking to you that this is the Jesus who was not heard when he prayed from the cross, that, that was in an impossible situation that his father resurrected him from the grave, that he was crushed for your inequity. Does it not make you stand back and say, could it be that he is the Lord Almighty, the God of angel armies would do that for me, that I could come into a living hope and relationship with him and come to the temple differently differently than my friend that I mentioned at the beginning of the party, that you wouldn't have to stand here and hear, do you realize who you're singing to, who you're approaching? I do realize, because God tailor makes these situations for us to see that he is the Lord Almighty, the God of angel armies. Let's pray together. Father, that is our cry, that in our church, in our nation, and even individually, God, you know how to deal with us in the exact way for us to once again realize who it is we approach in Shiloh, who it is we speak before, who it is we make promises before, who it is we give up our greatest possessions because we realize that it belongs to the Lord Almighty, the God of angel armies in the first place. God, may this name, may it make all the difference to us in the world and may we realize that you, Lord Jesus, that you are this king and that you have done amazing things for us. God, tailor make these circumstances like you've done in my life for us to come to this point. We pray this in your name and for your renewed glory. Amen.